I'm Kevin Sikowski. I'm not sure if everybody knows me. I saw a couple of names maybe I didn't recognize. Um, I'm a professor at the University of Toledo, and this is a GLOBE Mission Earth webinar. We're going to focus on using ArcGIS and putting GI your data into GIS. So just a reminder, this is part of our Mission Earth project, and which is a collaboration between the University of Toledo, Boston University, WestEd with UC Berkeley, Tennessee State University, and NASA Langley Research Center in Virginia. See, the, 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 the <laughs> talking to that's the picture I got of Grant. Man, I was uh, young, young back then. So. I guess, yeah. So uh, our speakers today are Grant Wilson and Sarah, Sarah Merzwiak. They're both graduate students at the University of Toledo. I don't know. I, I should take my picture off of there. I'm not so, so much uh, speaking, I guess. And uh, just to remind everybody, we have the Virtual Science Symposium for GLOBE deadline coming up April 3rd. I know there's a lot of students working on projects. Uh, the Regional Science Symposia, uh, the registration is online now. And um, let's see, I, I, I'll probably circulate an email uh, in the next few days or next week, kind of reminding everybody to register for the Regional Science Fair. And it'd be good to know if, if you're planning to go and you're in the Midwest, you know, are you planning to go with everybody else? Because we're thinking about getting a bus. So let us know. And then there's the annual meeting in Connecticut. So it looks to be an excellent time. And the, um, the student project, you know, they always have the student project. It's not an overnight this time, but it's on a research island. So I think that should be really fun for the kids to go and work together with students from all around the world. All right, so I guess um, Sarah and Grant, did either one of you decide which one is going first? Yeah, we figured Grant would go first. Okay, so I'd like to introduce Grant. Grant's, um, well, he's been a grad student a long time. <laughs> Professional. <laughs> Professional graduate student. And uh, he did his master's degree at the University of Toledo. I remember this correctly. And in geography and planning. And then now is working on his PhD in speech and integrated social science. Uh, he's been working with teachers. Um, let's see, we had a grant for five years. Leaders and now is working on nurturers. Correct. All right. So, Grant, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. All right. Let's see. Do I do anything special? You have to share your screen if you're gonna okay. do the PowerPoint. Okay. But otherwise I'm good where I'm at, or do I need to? Okay. All right. So um, as Kevin said, I am Grant Wilson. And um, what I currently do, just a little bit of background, um, is that I work with the Nurtures Grant, um, as well as trying to get my so I shouldn't say trying to get my, as well as pursuing my, my PhD in uh, spatially integrated social science. Um, in, with the Nurtures program, what, I'm, what I have the fortune to do is work with teachers in the K through third, pre-K through third grade levels. We develop curriculum um, and provide professional development for them um, to do science education and instruction at those younger grade levels. So it's been quite an adventure um, just to see what science looks like and how to get science out of the classroom. So that's been great. And any chance we get to incorporate data, visualization, graphing, all these things that hit all kinds of different um, standards that, you know, all of, all of you that are teachers are well aware of um, is a great opportunity. So that being said, um, let me share my screen real quick. Okay, well, oh, amateur PowerPoint mistake there, sorry. Okay, can everybody see that okay? Is that sharing? Yes. yes. Okay, all right. So um, I, I struggle with this title. Anyone that's used GIS will, will know that there's all kinds of and you colon and you can add whatever you want after it, um, tearing your hair out at the roots, um, crying for hours in a lab, or having a great time and learning it and not freaking out about it. Um, I see you smiling, Mike. Um, <laughs> 
Mike Henley is an awesome GIS scientist person, user of GIS. Um, so what I want to speak about is just basically a, a general introduction on what GIS is. And, I'm, and I want to also stress that it should be approachable, um, but it's definitely, and, and I mentioned this at the end, uh, the whole experience to get into your head is a learning by doing thing. So I'm just going to kind of give a, this is what GIS is, and this is kind of how to think about it. And Sarah's going to go into the more nuts and bolts of actually how to use it and, and, and what to do with it. And that's going to really be the learning by doing part. So um, any opportunity you get after this to just play around with it is, uh, is just time well spent um, on, on the whole endeavor. So um, GIS and you. So as you can see, even just from these initial pictures, um, what, the, the one on the top left there is uh, uh, layers, right? You're seeing layers of some sort of a land form at the bottom and then some sort of other data on top of it and then, and then a city with uh, buildings. Uh, and this is really uh, one of the best ways to kind of think about how a GIS system works. And it, it's a series of layers and, and provides you with data at different layers and different scales. Um, the, other, the other one in the corner there, for some reason, all the GIS people love to symbolize their databases with cylinders. I don't know if this is like the international symbol for a database, but, but cylinders are key. Um, so you see all the different maps stacked up there. There's one that's uh, probably at the bottom, um, I'm guessing maybe some population information. And, and then there's uh, um, uh, one at the top with topography. And you see that these layers are stacked. So this is just a kind of good way to get it in your head of what, what a GIS system is. Um, so here's a boring slide with a bunch of text that you're not supposed to have in a PowerPoint presentation. So what that is basically is what I want you to think about is a geographic information system. Um, it, the key to it is that it stores geographic data, right? And that's, that's in the title. So it could be an information system. So, you know, that, that means that it has a bunch of different things in it, stores information, data attributes. So you could have names, um, you can have birth dates, you can have ages of things. If you think about just kind of like a typical Excel spreadsheet, the key to a GIS system is that it has the, um, the spatial relationship. So some sort of identification that gives it a point in place in, in space. Um, and that's, that's the key. Um, so just kind of for a, for a thought example here about geodata. So if you think of a location, just think of your house. Um, how do you know where your house is? You know where your house is by having a home address, right? Now, yes, you know that your house has latitude and longitude, and, and that's important. But really, at the end of the day, the most important thing to you if you're telling someone how to get to your house is just to give them your home address, right? That allows them to locate where it is in space and get to it. Um, and then if you think about your house, um, you've got different attributes of things that are occurring at your house, right? So you have your, the type of house you have, um, the size of your house, who lives at your house, all these different things that are attributes of that location, right? And again, they're all tied to space. Um, if you think about relationships, so your neighbors, what's your neighbor doing to your left and your right? Um, is your neighbor mad because you have a tree that fell down today in the windstorm and is laying on their fence? Um, do you have parts of your neighbor's garbage cans? All these things, right? There's this whole inner, inner working of a relationship. And then also you have scale. So this is the extent at which you kind of consider the location information. So if you think about your house, your house is embedded within a neighborhood, right? And if you zoom out, that's in a town or a city. If you zoom out, that's within a county. If you zoom out, that's in a state. If you zoom out, you know, you've got a country, you've got a hemisphere, then you've got an earth, and then you've got a solar system. You can just keep going, right? Um, so what's important is that um, these, these ideas are, you know, just kind of sink in as to what, what things kind of frame your geographic information system. So location, attributes of the location, relationships and scale and size are important. Um, at the end of the day, what it really is is a, a system to organize all of this information and then tie it to a spatial location, right? And it's extremely data driven. So any data that you would bring in um, is, is important on what you wanna look at. And that data varies with how the, ge the geographic information system deals with it. So um, if you see at the bottom there, um, Again, pushing location, 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 right? This is, this is key in the system. But you have two kind of um, data types. You have discrete and continuous. If you think of discrete, this is where um, you'll hear the phrase points, lines, and polygons, right? That's, that's the popular kind of way to just encapsulate GIS data.
things, all those are line features. And then um, area, if, if you consider county data, for example. So, so if you look at uh, uh, aerial extent of a county, it aggregates all of that information about that county into one. You know how many people live in that county, what kind of median population, those kind of things, right? Uh, continuous data is things that, things that don't have necessarily a discrete point where you can just kind of stop and say, here's where it is 65 degrees. Here's where it is 64 degrees, okay? Now, I know it's a little bit, um, I don't want to get too much into that because based on, you know, you're taking temperature readings, for example, with the globe data at a specific place and you have a point and a location. So these are more of things you see in a system as a surface over time. For example, precipitation. I'll show you a wind speed map as well that kind of shows you how the data spreads over a larger area. Okay, any questions? Am I going too slow? Am I going too fast? <laughs> okay, um, so um, what are some familiar things, right? Google Maps, that's a familiar thing. Um, is Google Map a GIS? You could have a big argument about this. Um, some would say, yes, it is. Some would say it's a GIS viewer. Some would say it's just a way to visualize data. The same deal with Google Earth. Um, and, and, but, but these are familiar things to you that have these kinds of type, these types of data in here. So anybody that's used their phone or, or Google Maps to find a place, you've, you've searched. So exam, for example, here's directions from Toledo to Detroit. There's all kinds of awesome geographic data embedded in this map, right? That, that it just gives you and you don't even think twice about it. You've got, um, you've got uh, broken up parcels of land that it's showing. It's showing road networks. You've got points here for um, Toledo to Detroit. You've got line data here that shows you the roads. It's showing you different uh, routes that you can take on different line networks. It's showing you these little stars here are different schools um, that apparently I have been to uh, and favorited when I selected that information. So it's storing all kinds of data. So you can see that this, that Google Maps itself stores all kinds of data, spatial data that's relevant to me uh, and whoever else is accessing it, okay? So that's kind of one way to think. You're, you're using these kind of things already and you're familiar with them. Um, and they're not scary anymore, like they used to be. Um, so this is great, right? I want to go to Detroit, and now I know where to go. I know to take this way, and I know to avoid some other um, traffic situations. I know there's construction outside of Toledo, but is it, at the end of the day, I may want to know more, right? I don't just want to see what's on that map, and I don't. So Grant, I don't know if anybody can hear me, but we lost Grant. So Sarah lost Grant. So did, can anybody hear me? Yeah. Oh, hey. And I'm running on a generator, so is Jeff. We can hear you. I can hear you. <laughs> you, you want me to take over? It looks like we may have lost him. Maybe. Uh, hopefully, you can share your screen over. I still see him there. Maybe we give him another second. You see his lips moving? <laughs> oh, there he is. I'm back. You're back. Oh, am right. I back? Yeah. You're back. Right, gotcha. Back. Okay. Um, okay. So, where did I? <laughs> where? What was the last thing you remember me saying? <laughs> um, okay. Hello. So, it's been a while. <laughs> yeah. Oh, really? Yes. Wait, you showed the map of uh, going to Detroit. Okay. Uh, did you see where I danced? I got up and danced, and then no. I did the magic <laughs> show. And then, <laughs> oh, all right. Well, we missed all that. Darn. Okay, let me see. Um, so we were here. You guys saw this? Yeah. Okay. So I was just, uh, I was talking about being familiar to folks. They use Google Maps. All right, I will advance. Um, so Google Maps, we're familiar with Google Maps or by and large, you've used it on your computer, use it on your phone. But that's giving you the data that Google provides, right? So um, what if you wanna add in your own data and do your own analysis of things? And this is where the GIS information system or geographic information system is gonna come into play. Um, Sarah, this is the interface that they'll be using later, right? The online one? Correct. Okay, so everyone's gonna see this later, but this is just an example map. So there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff packed into this map right here. Um, this is basically the same 
uh, just for reference here, the same kind of extent that was on the Google map. So um, if you see the bottom Toledo, Lucas County is in orange there and uh, the population 441,815 is noted. Uh, and then Detroit's up um, from Windsor, you can kind of see it ghosted in the orange. Um, this map is showing you um, topography and then it has counties. So you can see the counties are broken up. Then it also is giving you the color coding. If you see on the, the left legend, that is giving you USA population density, okay? So that's showing you based on the color of orange that we have that the uh, people per square meter, or I'm sorry, square mile in Toledo is between 1,000 and 400, okay? This is also giving you all that shows you that Toledo or Lucas County, where Toledo is, has 441,815 people in there, in that, okay? Um, so this, inf this is giving you a lot of information that this allows you information um, all at once in, and at different, uh, different items or variables that you want to look at, okay? Um, basic maps from some of my um, dissertation work. So uh, this is showing you point data. So if you look at a one megawatt, so all those little, those red points are where there are wind power generating facilities in the United States as of 2014, okay? Then if you see that all of them have a little, um, a little uh, box with them, that is the county, the specific county in the lighter gray. So this is showing you both where the facilities are, the point data, and then it's showing you area data of the county that it's actually in, enclosed in. And then it's also showing you the state, right, as well. So you've got different layers of information. Um, this one is going to show you wind power class. So this actually um, is showing you the wind speed in miles per hour. Okay. So Oh, we lost Grant again. So there you are, Grant. We hey, lost Grant. you. Yeah, we lost you again. Oh, I okay. I think if you talk a little slower, maybe it I won't. don't know. <laughs> yeah, maybe it won't be as much data going through the system. The other, the other uh, approach would be to turn off your uh, camera. Oh, turn off your video. Okay, so you have a lower feed because it seems like it is coming through you. Okay. Or, I mean, it's through your internet issue. Let me see here. Um, let's see how I can. Now the lower left corner has stop video. Lower left. Hmm. Well, it's working now anyway. <laughs> so if you want to continue, I suppose. Maybe not. He's really good at staring at us. I'm sorry, everybody. We're having internet problems, but uh, you know, of course, we're having electricity problems. So it is quite a day. All right. Well, I'm not sure. Um, Grant was going to show his, his research in wind. I mean, we're probably generating lots of wind on the wind turbines today. Well, Sarah, Ooh. do you want? All right. Yeah, so is, my video any, is that any better? Yeah, we can hear you now. Well, it was a question. How high do the wind speeds go? That's a good question. I have to look that up. So, Sarah, why don't you why don't you uh, see if you can jump in? Okay, sure. Hmm. All right, Grant, if you can hear us, I'm going to take over here. Maybe we can finish you up at the end if we have time. So let me share my screen. Oh, 
I have to have him unshare. Well, I wonder if Janet can unshare it. I will see if I can do that. Um, Maybe if I make Sarah the host or co-host, yeah. it's it's me now. Now I see you. Um, I think I can do it. Let me try. Okay, see if you can share your screen. Does that work? Okay. Yeah, it did, it did say Sarah starting to share her screen. Okay. Yeah, That'd I can see it. Okay, so hi everyone, I'm Sarah. I'm also a PhD student at the University of Toledo and I work on the Globe Mission Earth Grant. Real quick before I start my um, presentation, I wanted to do a, a quick plug of the new Observer app. If you haven't actually downloaded the um, update for this, it's really cool. And uh, the coolest part that I think, um, in addition to all of the um, updates that or upgrades that they did this down here or no where is it it's somewhere in there but you can set the your notifications so what happens is that you can choose um, what times of day you can get some notifications of when satellites are coming over so it'll give you say like a 15 minute warning it'll say Hey, the satellite's coming over. Run outside and take some or some clouds observations right now. So I've been doing that. It's pretty cool. It's kind of like a nice interruption of your day, whatever you're doing. So if you haven't done that yet, definitely check it out. Okay, so I have two PowerPoints here, and I figured it was best to break them into two because I'll be talking um, first about uh, retrieving some data from Globe. And then secondly, taking that data and putting it into ArcGIS Online. So let me expand here. So the NASA flight that wasn't, some of you uh, are probably aware that we were going to have a special NASA flight to take place over the Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania area in late February. Um, we contacted teachers and the, uh, the teachers and students were going to collect some ground level data during this time to compare with the thermal imaging data from the NASA flight. But what happened was it got a cracked windshield and so it's been suspended indefinitely, unfortunately. So rather than just have that data go off into the breeze and no one really look at it, I figured, well, this tutorial we would look at that data because a lot of you put um, some effort into collecting that. So I'll use that data as an example in this um, presentation. So the dates that I looked at were February 21st to March 1st, and this is for the Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania area. Now this is the map that um, basically this part of the uh, presentation you, you end up with. So I'm going to show you in the next number of slides how I ended up with this particular map. And what you see here are these locations where surface temperature data was collected in this region. There were other locations where the data was collected, but I've excluded it. So I'll show you step by step. Um, so from the GLOBE homepage, you want to go into the visualization system, GLOBE data, visualize data. Um, before I, I do that, real quick, I just want to point out, if you haven't uh, tried this, but on the GLOBE homepage, if you click on the GLOBE there in the logo, it pops up and starts to spin and it'll show you different uh, groups and activities and cool things around the world that are happening in GLOBE. I just noticed earlier these look like a bunch of kids in, what, penguin costumes or something. That looked a little strange, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. So it's, it's really neat to see all the things that are happening in GLOBE around the world. So when you um, hit that link, then you can hit this button, enter into the visualization system, and a new tab will open up uh, on your computer. And this is what you see when you first open it. You'll have the welcome screen. And I'll be honest, I, today was the first I actually read through this. I always just jump right into reading things. But if you do take the time to read this little welcome screen, it gives you the the uh, basic instructions of what I'm going to show you here. 
So what you want to do is you want to add a data layer. And for this um, presentation, I'm looking at both surface temperature and surface temperature noons. So those are right here. So I added both of those. And what happens is that the, as soon as you add those layers, it defaults to the current day. So what you see here then are color-coded icons that indicate um, temperature recordings from around the world today. So since I'm interested in, um, oh, hold on. Okay, so since I'm interested in a date range, um, what I wanted to do is expand that out. And as soon as you click on this data counts link, it defaults to expand the bar that way and that way so that you get the entire history of all of the locations where surface temperature data has been collected around the world through that date range. So that's a lot of information there, so we want to reduce that down. So you enter in the dates, and then you can see between February 21st and March 1st, these are the locations where surface temperature data was collected. So to further refine that, um, I want to chop out all of those other data points and bring it down just to our region here that we're interested in. So you click on location slash site for the filter and then drawing on the map. And what this will allow you to do then is to um, draw a polygon around the area you're interested in. I know it's kind of hard to see here, but you can see these little green dots, and those are the additional data that we're going to try to exclude here. So what you do is you click on this little orange, um, or this little polygon symbol here, and it'll turn orange. And that what that does is activate the drawing tool. And when you click once, and then drag and then click again and drag you can draw your shape and when you're done drawing you just double click and automatically it will just display data within that area okay so now i've done that and the data is limited to the spatial area that i'm interested in so one part that can get confusing here is if you don't click back out of or back onto this hand symbol here, you'll be stuck in that polygon drawing mode wherever you try to click. So make sure you click back on that hand symbol. So now that we have our data limited to the time frame that we're interested in and the spatial area that we're interested in, you can click on the title of any of these layers and then view the layer table associated with that layer. And what you see is something like this. Now again, this is the actual count of data, meaning that at this school there were three times that during that time frame that the um, school collected surface temperature data and so on. So that's not what we want to display in ArcGIS. So how do we get that data? And I'll show you. So if you go back out to the Globe homepage, now there's an, a very quickly, let me go back. Um, what you could do through here manually, which I almost did and decided not to, you could just go back to measurements and go day by day. So start with February 21st, then the 22nd, then the 23rd, so on, and then download each of those layer tables and export them and combine them together manually. But a faster way to do that is if you go back out and instead of going into the globe visualization system, you go into the data retrieval tool, which is under here, under retrieve data. And what this is, is uh, they call it the advanced data access tool. Sounds kind of a fancy name for just a bunch of tabular data, but that's exactly what it is. It's, it's tabular data, so it's not displayed in a map-based visualization system. And this is where you can go to download large sets of large data sets, and they come also in a CSV file format that you can bring into Excel. So basically what you want to do is you want to start on the left here, start selecting your filters. So again, chose surface temperature noon, surface temperature, added those protocols. And it found 1,257 sites where surface temperature has been collected. And then I want to, and that, again, that defaults to throughout the entire history of GLOBE. So I want to filter by a date range. So I enter in my dates here, February 21st, March 1st. And then it's reduced down to 78 sites. Now, 
this is around the world. You can see we've got some um, locations outside of the US. So you can filter also by um, country. I guess in the future you'll be able to filter by cities, but um, currently you can't do that. So I reduced it down to locations in that time frame in the United States for surface temperature. And this is what I ended up with was 42 sites. And so now I've got the data narrowed down to something manageable, something I'd like to look at. And what you do is you click this obtain measurement data button here. And depending on your speed and processing and, and how the globe website is behaving that day, it may take a few minutes and then you'll be able to download that CSV file. So what you wanna do is save that CSV file somewhere you'll remember because that's what you'll use to then pull into ArcGIS Online. So very briefly, I'm gonna switch out to my second um, presentation here. I'm not sure if anybody had any questions on that so far. Uh, let's see. Hey, hey, Sarah, I got a question. Sure. Yeah. Go ahead. I noticed on the um, on the um, the observation tool, our school didn't show up, but on the um, advanced uh, data search, it did show up. And that's odd because I, at least maybe it was there. I just didn't see it on your. Well, it's, Melody, sometimes that happens, and if you okay. see that. Send a message to help at globe.gov. All right. Because that, that happened to my data here at the University of Toledo. Okay. Um, I'll have to yeah, check it out. There's glitches sometimes, I think. Yeah, and actually that's probably a good rule of thumb then. You know, if you really are trying to, to view your data, check both the visualization system and the data retrieval tool. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Okay, so let me bring up this other one. So now that you've, you've saved that data into an Excel file onto your computer, you have what you need to start working with ArcGIS. And I'm gonna show you ex an example here of using that surface temperature data and combining it with an interesting map layer that I found uh, freely available within the ArcGIS online system. So just real quickly, why use ArcGIS Online? Well, it's cool, that's my opinion, but uh, you know, check it out and find out for yourself, it's free. And uh, once you do check it out, you're going to start to be amazed at how many map layers there are available and, and the endless amount of teaching tools that there are within this resource. So again, I'm going to combine that surface temperature data and bring it in and, and uh, layer it with an interesting on, or ArcGIS Online map that I found. So this is just one example of a combination of Globe and ArcGIS Online. As you can imagine, you could come up with a zillion examples to um, help the students get excited about their Globe data. So when you go to ArcGIS.com, if you have an account already, when you sign in, you will enter the University of Toledo's ArcGIS Online account. If you don't have that, send me an email and I can send you an invitation because otherwise, if you go into ArcGIS.com and create your own public account, you won't have access to our storage abilities and um, the maps that we've created already. Um, that's still, it's something that you can do if you want to, but this is kind of a fast and easy way to get, um, a, you know, using ArcGIS Online easily. So, so and I'll jump in. Um, yeah, so we, we set up, and I know many of you have accounts already that we did during training sessions, but you may have forgotten what your login is. Yeah. And uh, I think Sarah can handle that and help yeah. you out. But, uh, I mean, on the, on the other side is, I believe ArcGIS, the whole thing is available for free to all teachers in the country right now. Um, you just have to go get it, I think. I'm not sure how you would go get it. So the easy way is to do the online one with us, and that might be a good start. And uh, some of you who may want to go in more depth after that could you know, get a full version for your school. Yeah. 
And what's cool too, after you start creating your own maps and saving them, you can share them with everyone for free through uh, a public link that you can send. So it's not just a place to explore, but it's a place to also save your maps into your own gallery. So when you do sign into our account, what you see here is it defaults to the home page, which I just realized we could spruce this up a little. So maybe that's something that we'll do in the future here. But if you click on map, this is uh, the mapping area that, that defaults. This is what first comes up. And what I, this is um, the same as what I showed last summer in our um, teacher institute. So if you add and then search for layers, then you can get into the ArcGIS Online system. So there's options here, but make sure you choose ArcGIS Online or this Living Atlas layers. There's a lot of the, a lot of the layers are in both of these, but um, you could do a search within those. If you select, if you leave it on the default of my organization, what that will do is it'll only search within the University of Toledo's maps that have been saved in the gallery there for our organization. So you want to open yourself up to the entire world of ArcGIS Online by selecting one of these. So in this case, I just figured I'd type in the word urban, and I chose uh, Living Atlas Layers. And so one of the, I scrolled down through and kind of looked at some of these. You can look at descriptions for the different layers. Um, but this one I thought was really cool. It was called World Urban Areas. So I hit the Add button. And you can continue doing that. You can add more layers if you want because you can turn them on and off once you're done. When you are done, you hit this done adding layers. And if we zoom into our region here, what you see are the extent of um, urbanization around each of the major cities in the area. And so just very briefly, I know there's some activity in the chat I haven't been able to keep up with, but um, as I'm going through the rest of this, because the answer will be at, towards the end here, uh, if you'd like to type in the chat any ideas, why do you think that I would choose this kind of um, map to layer our surface temperature data with? So let's go back very quickly. Um, uh, remember, this is the map and globe that I showed. So this was reduced down to the data that we actually collected. These are locations during that time frame for surface temperature. And then here is the Excel sheet as it was saved. And I didn't change anything. This is how it looked as soon as I saved it onto my hard drive. And it looks kind of messy. If you scroll through, there are a lot of different columns and a lot of information in it. And so what I recommend here is that you keep this original file and then save it as a new file and then just chop out all the, the stuff that you don't want to display on ArcGIS. And that's what I did here. So if you scroll all the way over towards the end, this is where the actual values for the surface temperatures were. So, um, and just, just think about what types of things you may want to view on ArcGIS Online, probably the name of the school, the site name, the date, definitely the latitude and longitude, and the surface temperature value. So once I do that, I've chopped out everything that I didn't need and saved it as a revised data sheet. And now this has all the most important information for me. So back in ArcGIS, if you do that same option where you add, but instead you choose, um, instead of add a layer from ArcGIS Online, you can add a layer from a file on your local hard drive. So just browse to where I saved that um, Excel sheet with the reduced uh, data in there and import it. And this is what immediately pops up. And so there's something wrong with this. Does this look right? So we've got some big dot here in the center of the states and a bunch of little dots. And if you look closely, what this is actually showing, so look at your key, it defaulted to that column in the Excel sheet that was elevation. And so to change that, you go through and you just select on option one here 
which attribute do you want to show? And when you do this drop down menu, you'll see all of the different uh, headings from your Excel sheet. So you scroll to the end, select on your surface temperature, and voila, there's our surface temperature data. And you can see it automatically um, provides you with um, different size symbols to indicate uh, higher values versus lower values. And if you go down to this option two and start playing around with, with the different um, display options or drawing styles, you can um, display these data points differently. So I decided to, to choose this one called the heat map because this is surface temperature, so I thought it would look kind of interesting. And it did, so I zoomed in here to the area, um, and you can see now where these data points overlay with the urbanized areas. And in particular, um, zooming in closer, this is now where you have your a really good opportunity to have a discussion with your students. So where are the hottest surface temperature recordings from our data that was collected? And how do those uh, correspond with the urbanized areas? So you can see here we have a hot location here within the hotter, relatively hotter, location here within the urbanized area of Toledo. So some of you probably got in, sorry, I haven't been able to keep up with the chat, but um, the reason I chose that urbanized areas layer within ArcGIS Online to combine with our surface temperature data was to lead you into the discussion of the urban heat island effect. And you can imagine that if you had a larger data set, this would become even more apparent if you combine these two. And you can also use this as um, kind of a, a springboard also to ask the students where else around their school or in their community could they collect additional surface data to investigate the urban heat island effect. So I hope that this provides you um, one example of the many, many, many different examples that you can come up with when you combine your GLOBE data into ArcGIS Online and just explore the different um, free map layers that exist there. So just very quickly, um, some other cool um, maps that are on there on ArcGIS Online. There is this drought map, drought tracker, uh, there was this one, river and freshwater wetland abundance. And again, just there are endless maps available. And if you go on here and click gallery, you can start searching through and you can reduce it down to different content areas that you may be interested in. So these are all freely usable um, pre-made maps that are very, very well done in many cases and can be used to really get your students excited about uh, the data that they're currently collecting and how that relates to the, a larger worldview. So thank you. Sorry if I was a little wordy and took a little long, but if you need some additional information, feel free to email me. And again, if you'd like an invitation to join our, our ArcGIS online group, just uh, let me know and I'll send you an invitation. All right, so I'll stop sharing here. Hey, I see, yeah, a lot of people got urban heat island effect. Excellent, good job. Earth Observatory about urban heat islands in the Earth Observatory kids issue, cool. Okay. Well, Dr. C, is there any discussion, any other things that took place while I was talking that we should talk about? I wonder if we lost him too. Hey, hey Sarah. Yeah, hi, Melody. Um, it was just interesting that when we were taking data out over that time that it was 70 out. <laughs> so I'm just curious if it was how those temperatures were different up there in Michigan where it was not urban. I'm not sure if that was due to urban heat island effect or other things. So yeah, um, we do have to consider those things sometimes 
uh, and encourage students to look a little deeper and just don't look at face value. Absolutely. Yeah. Think about time of year and then time of day and the weather conditions that day for sure. So you can see, and, and that's kind of the idea, right? So this is a springboard for, uh, for much larger discussions here. I have a quick question. Has anybody, sure. this is Svetlana, hi. Um, has anybody, um, so there was, no, there was no data available for some of the rural areas, right? So we couldn't actually compare. Very um, few. So has anybody who's used this um, used it as an opportunity to contact a rural school and see if there'd be a way of those kids collecting some data so that we could compare? Have you guys tried anything like that? Or it seems like it'd be a cool way to engage um, schools in other areas that are less urban. <laughs> Yeah, actually, that's a really great idea. We could almost have our own campaign and say with the purpose of investigating the urban heat island effect. And again, later on in the year, as it gets warmer into the summer season, that would be a really interesting thing that we could do. I know we do have some more rural schools that have participated, but um, again, remember that we were looking at a very narrow time frame, so a week or something like that. Um, so if we if I had expanded that out to a larger time frame, it probably could have shown more correlations between urban and rural. So but, but we could have even done it in other countries, right? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So it you know again, kind of like Grant said, you know, once you start playing around with our with any GIS platform, really you start to see how many different options there are. It's, it's just mind boggling and it's, um, and obviously probably the students will run with it faster than we do. Right. Right. Oh, hey Steve, that's cool. Steve, can you, can you unmute and tell us about that real quick? I think I'm unmuted now. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I mean, we have like smaller universities, especially like down, I'm south of Akron. So it's easier for me to deliver. I, I, I'm just a delivery boy at that point. But they'll contact professors, like we have an Ohio State branch here. We have a University of Akron branch down here. So they've contacted professors that are in the sciences. You know, they just look up the staff directory, and just do some cold calls, and, and I'm getting a, I'm getting an echo. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, my computer. But anyway, yeah, they contact these professors at university and talk to them about and how to use the equipment and basically train them to use the equipment. And I'm just a delivery boy. I you know, hey, they need a IRT at you know, this person. And then I, you know, I get to meet the professors that way too. And it's, it's kind of cool because there was one in particular that thought he didn't know me. He thought I was a university professor. and was one of my uh, university students speaking with him and it was really a seventh grader in disguise. So yeah, they're kind of, you know, <laughs> it was kind of cool because she was well, well spoken. And I mean, it kind of speaks with how our kids can talk to adults when they, you know, when they know what they're doing. So but yeah, I mean, that's how my kids in the city have made contacts, you know, in surrounding areas uh, so they can collect, you know, rural data for them. We've contacted other Globe schools too, of course, but as far as, you know, getting more local data where we did not have, you know, Globe trained uh, folks around us, that's how my kids have done it. Steve, that's really cool. Have you guys ever used ArcGIS Online or any other, or, or the desktop version or anything before? Uh, we've looked at it, <laughs> but we, 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 we really haven't used it, used it, but I mean, we've, we've seen it, but we haven't used it. Okay. Well, like I said, if, um, I can't remember if you're a member of our group or not, but if not, um, let me know and I'll send you an invitation. And again, it's, it's pretty, I think it's fairly user friendly and, uh, the kids will probably think that even more so than us older folk oh yes oh so, yeah then and you know let them log in and start playing with it and you know the uh, possibilities are endless okay i'll mute myself again <laughs> okay <laughs> thanks steve 
So Jackie asks, or she said, there are too many tutorials out there. Do you have a favorite? Um, me personally, I just jump in and start clicking. You know, right. I mean, you, you kind of have to be fearless with a lot of these things. And, and I think in a lot of ways, that's what these younger students have the ability to be, is fearless with this technology. Yeah, so the way the students do it is they, um, if they need to know how to do something, then they'll Google it and watch a video of someone else doing it. It's similar to the way my kids play video games. They watch people playing video games on a video. I don't understand it. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what they do. So then they know how to do it on the video game, I guess. So. Um, Dr. C, you want to answer Jackie's other question here. So she has a public account, but should she switch over to our UT account? I, I don't think she has to. Um, no, I don't think there's any need to. If she's able to use it, it's fine. <laughs> That's for Minecraft. Yes, Minecraft, of course. <laughs> There's a British guy who does hour-long videos, and anyway. And did we, uh, do we still have Grant here, just real quickly? Yeah, Grant, are you here? Yes, I am. All right. And you mentioned the AAG GeoMentor program. You just want to real quickly say something about that? Yeah, um, I, I always meant to sign up for it, but never did. Um, but um, basically what, what that was a, an effort by the Association of American Geographers or the American Association of Geography or Geographers to um, kind of link up people that um, are, are academics or professors or people that actively use GIS systems with educators that might need help or assistance or just guidance. Um, so you can go on, that link has a map and they also just have a, like a Google Docs that you can go on um, and see everybody that's signed up and there's somebody, um, there's some people in Toledo and some people throughout Ohio as well um, that uh, are willing to work with you and either provide guidance or, you know, just kind of suggestions about projects you have. And it's a good way to kind of collaborate with people that are doing applied GIS work, which is always, is, is always helpful in learning it. Um, kind of just as an aside to what, what Kevin and Sarah said as well, if you can get your hands on something that somebody's already done and kind of reverse engineer it, that also helps as well. So if you can get, you know, a shape file or some data and, and see how it all kind of goes together to work and then start pulling it apart. That also helps you kind of see the nuts and bolts of how things work. So. So Jackie, which one are you uh, asking about? What's the reference for that? It's a reference, uh, Grant. It's up on the top, the AAG one. I don't know if you can see it in the chat. Yeah. I think you use CSV files, Jeff. Um, the nice thing, we used to, and some of you uh, attended these trainings, I know this. We used to have to manipulate the Excel file in order to get the columns in the right places, then to be able to bring it up into ArcGIS. Um, but now it recognizes latitude and longitude wherever it is in the file. So that's, that's a great improvement that ArcGIS made, Esri made. There's also a guided tour um, with the... Uh the ArcGIS online system. So when you start it up immediately, there's like a guided tour that, that everyone can go through that might, that also might be a really good tutorial, Jackie, that you might be looking for. That might be good just as a, you know, to go through it step by step. Yeah. And just an open invitation too. If any of you do start using this and uh, run into a roadblock and are pulling your hair out, you know, I can always open a Zoom room for just the two of us and we can share screens and I can help you out. So feel free, you know, send me an email if you need it. Right. And that's just, we get you over the hump kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So Grant, could you post that link again to the mentor? Mm -hmm. Thing, Yeah. Great. Thanks. Well, uh, we're winding down here. Um, Grant did have this great uh, presentation about his PhD work. Uh, 
Maybe we'll have to see it another time uh, on wind energy. Uh, I think we should wrap up. Let's see here. You can all see my email. So our next webinar is going to be March 22nd. And uh, we're going to have a group of teachers sharing how they implement GLOBE in their classrooms. So this one, we should try to get wide um, distribution so we get lots of people on. Uh, I think it would be very helpful for anybody who is doing GLOBE. Uh, and we'll have a variety of teachers. So hopefully, um, you know, the different grade levels, and it'll be a grade level that matches everyone's needs. So different ways of doing GLOBE in their classroom. And just wanted to thank you. Um, had to put this up here. We have Twitter account. Janet worked um, <laughs> probably for a week. No, I was <laughs> just kidding. But it took a lot of time. I know it took a lot of time for Janet to get Twitter going. I've never done Twitter. So uh, talk about you know keeping off of Facebook and whatnot. But I don't do Twitter or Snapchat or any of those other ones. But if you want it, we have all these Mission Earth uh, links, YouTube. Our video uh, capture from tonight will go on YouTube. Uh, so if anybody missed it, they can watch it, you know, anybody you know. Where are all those links posted? Oh, well, I was just showing it, but. I know, that's the <laughs> screenshot, but where can I go to get all those links? Well, that's a good question. Uh, Janet, do you know if, uh, are all the links on our Globe Mission Earth webpage? I know some of them are. I okay. can send Jackie it in an email. I can send okay. it to everybody at the meeting. That'd be great. Because uh, what we're trying to do is get all of our stuff at the Globe Mission Earth webpage. And Sarah's uh, been doing a great job of getting that together. Yeah, there'll they'll okay. be more updates on that. And those links will be pretty much on every page there. And I think, Janet, we also have them on the Facebook page. OK. Kevin? Yes. They need to be linked to some general place that people can access first. For example, if I forgot all about the name of your grant, I would look up your name and at UT and see if I could follow some links there. Hmm. But I, I, well, need, I need, it, it need to be on the Globe UT or something generic that someone would, would search. Otherwise, I'll idea. never get to any of those because I, I don't uh, navigate Facebook a lot. So right. I, if but, it's on Facebook, Jackie, I can, yes? If you do a general search, Globe Mission Earth, they'll come up. Yes, it's but Google. if I forget Globe Mission Earth, then I'm out of luck, right? But you have to remember that, yeah. <laughs> Globe Mission Earth. Well, we'll get it. I mean, how long did it take me to remember that it was St. Ursula Academy, not St. Ursula's, <laughs> right? That took me... Yes, uh, but if you Google it, you'll, it'll come up with the right answer. If I Google <laughs> I so. your name, I want this grant to come up somewhere quickly. Yeah, I think it's a good idea that we try to get something on the, uh, the links on the University of Toledo webpage. It's probably a good idea. And just to have a big also, jumping off page. You can also find it by going through globe.gov, right? Yes. Okay, so I go to globe.gov, and where do I go then? Or I, what's the next thing I search? Mission <laughs> Earth. But I don't know Mission Earth. If I forget that three weeks from now. You're going to remember you have it. To, uh, you have to remember <laughs> Kevin's name and search his name. Okay, it'll come up under Kevin's name then? Uh, let me check. We have the same problem for, yeah, for all of us, I think. This is actually a really good idea, and this is something that we could each do. We could update our profiles on globe.gov, our individual profiles with this information. Well, it's got to be more than that, because I, it needs to be something generic that I would, I would go to globe and I'd say, okay, I need to know about that thing I did last month with the guys from UT. How do I get there? So I have to type in UT or someone's name. If I remember your name or Kevin's name, that's good. But I may not remember the name of everybody's grant that I'm working with. Not that Kevin's isn't top on my list. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, uh, I think that's a good idea that we should work on making it easier to find us. I like that idea. 
But I don't know if we could be on Globe's main page all the time because that changes. No, we can't be, right? We can't be on Globe's but main page. So see, could make many a, of us are, are linked with Kevin. And so if Kevin on her, his home page at the university had this link, I could always go to Kevin's home page and I would have all the links there, or at least the link to the links. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, we'll work on that. Okay. Although then you have to be able to spell Kevin's last name. Uh, well, it comes up really easily. It actually does. <laughs> so. Uh, it's all over the web. Just put Kevin up, comes Kevin. It is. That's why when, when Grant's not, you can't find Grant, you know, it's like, what's up with that? But yeah, I'm, you can find me. So let's see. Just share my, my homepage here. Uh, now, me changing this is not easy, unfortunately. It's not like I can just change it. Um, Why? Is it not yours? That is correct. So um, I have, I'll have to figure out how to get this. Because I have, yeah, I don't have a mention of Mission Earth on here at all. So I have to get that going. All right. Well, thanks, Jackie. Yeah. See that? We didn't yeah. think of that. So do I, do I give you a timeline on that? Timeline? Next week? <laughs> <laughs> Due date? <laughs> we'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah, my blog got hacked. So um, my course I, starts next week. I don't have a personal blog anymore, Melody. Um, so I do blogging on the Globe website, and uh, I actually owe, I, I need to do one for El Nino, right, Kristen? If you're still on, yeah, you're still on. And then uh, I need to do one probably for the surface temperature. I did a very simple one. Anyway, um, we'll, we'll work on our presence. I, I think we, we did well. We got a, an actual page on the Globe website for Mission Earth, and. Each of our partners, like Svetlana, who's on tonight uh, with West Ed, they have a link, you know, a page, and they're uh, developing that uh, very nicely. So we'll get it um, so it makes it, there's more places pointing to the one location. I like the idea. Okay, can the, na the grant, name of the grant, I better write this down again. Grant, what was the name of the grant? Mission, Mission something. Or other. Mission Earth. Mission Earth? Okay. Yes. All right. Well, I'm going to let everybody go because you probably have to put gasoline in your generator, <laughs> which uh, Kathleen went and got gas for us. So it was very nice. So I, I'll fuel up before uh, we go to bed. All right. Take care, everybody. I'll see you on the 22nd.